today we're gonna to talk about running Wasm components in the browser. WebAssembly started in web browsers and then evolved with Wasm components for server-side use cases. And today we're gonna to bring it full circle back to the web browser. We're gonna do the talk in two parts to highlight two different really cool use cases for running WebAssembly components in the browser. Many's gonna start with running Wasm components client-side and I'll finish with running server-side WebAssembly components in the web browser and service workers without a server, truly serverless. Hi, I'm Mendy Berger, software engineer at Trendalage. And I'm Calvin Pruitt of Jaff Labs, just another framework labs. So WebAssembly component model. The WebAssembly component model uh, is a way to describe how c different components uh, talk to each other. And there are lots of aspects to that, but we want to touch on one point, and that's the IDL it describes. Uh, the way it describes this IDL is through a language called WIT. WIT lets you uh, describe high-level types that can be generated, um, that you can use to generate cross-language uh, uh, code that works in most popular languages. And as an example, you can see this uh, with package. You can see it has a interface example in that there's a resource called something, and something has a method to say. So the py in Python, that would generate a class with a method say. In Rust, that would be a struct with a method say. In JavaScript, that would be a class slash object with a method say. So in each language, it would translate it to whatever makes sense in that language. So Wasm has this problem. It can't really access anything, any web APIs without JavaScript directly injecting that into Wasm. So how do you deal with that? So now, the way you do it, you would manually have to inject each one, and there are tooling to help, help, to help with that. But can we bring all web APIs to, WIT through, uh, to, to Wasm through WIT and the component model? So how are web APIs described? Right now, most of them are described in WebIDL, and we can just take the WebIDL, convert that into WIT, and then create a package, and we did that, we called that browser.wit, and that has all web APIs. So what's the process of doing that, actually? How do we translate types in WebIDL to WIT? So WebIDL is a Boolean type. That's easy to translate, WIT also has a Boolean type, uh, WebIDL has number types. Same goes to WIT. WebIDL has multiple string types. But we, can, we don't have to take different string types. We can just have one string type for, to, for all of them. So WIT only has one string type. But that doesn't mean that everything is easy to translate. Some of them are really hard to translate. So how do we translate uh, objects or JavaScript symbols? It's not clear. We're not sure. And we have some ideas, but we haven't really solved it yet. So we would like inputs from the community. If you have any thought, thoughts of how to do that in WIT, we would love to hear them. But that doesn't really hold us off from making progress. We can make progress with the other types. So now that we do have browser.wit, how do we make sure that we still have to provide all those web APIs? And if we would try to provide all web APIs uh, directly to Wasm, that would really be large. That would be a lot of web APIs. So how can we deal with that problem? So JavaScript has this in interesting construct called a proxy. And you can proxy an object and intercept whenever you try to do anything with that object. You can just intercept that and change it and do whatever you want. So we just proxy the whole window object, the whole global object, uh, and that's the Wasm import, that one proxy. And then whenever Wasm tries to do, to access a web API, we just use that proxy to translate it into something that uh, the web expects, like JavaScript expects, uh, run that function, and then return whatever uh, Wasm expects. And with this approach, we believe it, that we can create one glue file that will work for all web APIs that's gonna be less than 100 lines of code. And that, that's uh, fairly simple to actually get done, we believe. We have some prototypes of it. 
So let's look at a demo of this actually working. So here you can see we have two very simple web components. This is like a collapsible component. And this one is a progress bar. Now it's 25%. Uh, we can change it to 85%. Yeah, just a regular web component. Nothing interesting about it. But what is interesting about it is in what language they're written. So let's first look at the first one. It's written in Rust. And there's some bind chain code. But then you just use, you define an element. Uh, you pass in observed attributes if you've ever written a web component. This is how you do it. You can set it as form associated. That's a new, newer part of uh, web components. And use regular web components to actually add styles, document and create element. Like all that, these are regular web APIs, but you use it from Rust and it feels rusty. And for the, the other component, the progress bar, that's written in Python. And you can see we describe it here. We have a percent uh, attribute that we observe. And we use the same APIs. We, use, we attach a shadow. We do all, do all those regular web APIs to, in, from Python. And we describe a web component that way. Thanks, Mindy. So how is it that we are running WebAssembly components in JavaScript uh, environments and web browsers when they don't natively yet support WebAssembly components? Well, we need uh, Project Jco to do a transpile of a WebAssembly component, break it out into its core modules, and generate some JavaScript glue code to make it all work. And what that looks like is uh, doing a transpile here, and this is a simple uh, WASI HTTP proxy uh, component uh, that responds to an inbound HTTP request and says hello world. And what you end up generating with Jco is a JavaScript uh, file with glue code, and I can show you that, and two core WASMs here, and uh, some TypeScript uh, definition files. So you can see what this sort of looks like. It's a bunch of low-level functions, but they end up uh, instantiating uh, the core WASM modules and kind of wire everything up. And you're not gonna really play with this code. Uh, it's all generated. But what's interesting also is Jco itself is a WASM component. And we actually use Jco to build Jco CLI and transpile it so that we have an NPM publishable uh, CLI that we can use to exercise the component. And we're actually gonna use Jco's component transpiled for the browser today as well. And what we're gonna do is actually, let's, let's start with uh, running a uh, simple hello world here on Wasm time. And you see it's a hello world proxy world. Uh, actually, uh, let me let me actually go back to my slides. Sorry, um, need to. So uh, th there's actually a few challenges here. I should highlight before I go into more of the demo. Um, there's a few challenges with getting WASI 0.2 to run in the web browser. One is you need to implement uh, the WASI APIs uh, with web platform integration. Uh, things like file system, HTTP, uh, WASI IO, CLI, so you need like environment variables and things like that. And uh, these mostly map to web platform APIs. There's different ways to actually uh, implement that. Um, you, for instance, the file system, you could actually implement it with like IndexedDB or something in memory or uh, file system API or origin file system API. Uh, and you can actually implement uh, the other like draft WASI proposals like blob store and uh, key value and things like that as well. But web platform APIs are largely async. And the assumption in a lot of the WASI 0.2 APIs is that you need a block. And we need a way to suspend the execution of a WASM method call, uh, function call into, um, and wait to an async uh, function completes, that task completes, and then reinitiate uh, the progress on the WASM. Now, 
it's a little tricky. There's a few different ways to do that today uh, in web browsers. Um, one is you could actually use a service worker and a web worker with a synchronous XHR request. It's not a really great way to do it, but it does have, it does work. Um, and in some environments where you do have access to a shared array buffer and atomics, you can block and wait and wait, uh, and wake up the uh, WASM execution when it's operating on another thread. But the other options are more async. Um, so you could use Binarian's WASM opt asyncify pass to rewrite uh, the WASM binaries and instrument them to uh, save their stack to the linear memory and then replay it. But really what we want is JavaScript promise integration, and that's coming soon. It's under origin trial right now in Google Chrome and should be available and stable, I'm hoping in the next few months. Uh, and I think the other browsers will fall suit next year. And what that allows you to do is wrap your imports and exports basically in promises, and uh, it natively solves this problem for you. So let's go to a demo. Uh, but before I go to the demo, I just wanna actually highlight something. Um, service workers, uh, what they are is it's a special web worker in web browsers that have some restrictions, and they can intercept all outgoing HTTP requests and respond as if the server was responding. And that allows you to have offline apps or pretend to be a server for caching purposes or whatever else. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use service workers to run a WebAssembly component that is designed to run on the server. So taking a WASM component that is a server deployment and running it completely client-side. So let's take a hello world one that's running here very quickly on WASM time. And let's, let's run that. So this is a uh, website that I built, uh, deployed on http.new. And what it's doing is we're getting a file picker and we're pointing to that same WASM binary that we're just running in WASM time. And we're using JCO transpile, all executing client side in the browser, generating the JavaScript glue code and setting things up so that the service worker will respond as if it's the server. And so we can click run component and you can see it's doing that here. And we can actually you know, just file off a, kind of a get request and you see that there. And so let's, let's do something a little bit more complicated, but you can see it's actually responding as the service worker here on the network calls. So let's run a more of a full stack application here. And let's actually load that uh, localhost. Okay, let me zoom in. So this is an, a WebAssembly component that uh, has uh, some static pages and an API and it's Connect, it's making outbound communication to GitHub's API on a particular repo uh, pulling open issues. Uh, and this is the particular issues. Uh, and so we're listing these issues and you can view them from the app and we can create new issues. So you can see it's kind of rendering them. And we can create a new issue. Awesome time. Okay, submit. So, got that, and you can see it's working over here. Hello, WasmCon, example from Wasm time. All right, and we can actually see on here on the console that as we're browsing and hitting API requests, it's being logged out to standard out. Uh, so, anytime you visit an one, it's logging, you can see the things there. Now let's stop that. And now let's actually run this same component in a service worker. Now let's pull up in network tab. Okay, so it just very quickly grabbed this and transpiled it. And let's run this. 
Okay, so now we are executing in a service worker. And now from this window tab, you're actually seeing the network request hit the WASM component in the service worker. But in this window, you're seeing uh, it as it, the servers actually being logged out. So uh, we can let's see. Sorry, here, maybe let's just do it from here. So you can see uh, the standard out being logged here and uh, execute request and you can see the API response. This is hitting from the service worker. And we're running this completely client side from the service worker. Okay. All right, cool. And let's see, oh, also one more thing. Uh, if you use HTTP.new, you can point to publish packages on WA to dev uh, registry and you can immediately run them. So this is another kind of app. Cool, all right. Um, I think that's all we wanted. I just wanna show them ah, yes. that, uh, where, where is it? This is all running in HTTP.new, a local server all the time from the service worker. There's no actual server, it's all in the service worker. So this is also just HTTP.new, which is quite cool a full ser web server in the service worker. Yeah. Uh, so these are some links to the uh, projects that we kind of mentioned here. Um, and we're happy to take some questions. Do you want to take the mic? Can I just okay. um. Thanks. Um, so when I, I looked at Jayco, um, the Binaries that were generated were relatively large, so I'm talking like seven, eight megabytes, um, even for a simple hello world. Um, can you show how big is yours? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, uh, which, which of the binaries were? Uh, so the WebAssembly that you generated with uh, Jayco? Yeah. So uh, are you talking about uh, when it's transpiled or the, the, the actual starting components, the problem of uh, creating WebAssembly components that are small enough? Uh, so I guess essentially the thing that you're loading in your application. So right here, let me see if I zoom in, but um, so if so you go the, in the GitHub um, uh, manager one's 562 kilobytes, and uh, the, I've some, the Hello World is 79 kilobytes. The last one is huge, but we yes. didn't even try. <laughs> we we just, just the, didn't get, we compiled in a lot of stuff that shouldn't be in there. Yeah, uh, it's, that's not natural. That's the uh, that's large. The, how large is it? I can't really see it. So that uh, the uh, the really large one is 138 megabytes. Okay, uh, yeah. that is that's what uh, I would have expected. Okay. Yeah, so that, so each one of these binaries are self-contained. They're each individual uh, apps. Um, uh, more questions? So the reason why that one is very large is uh, it's using a lot of Python. This actually isn't a question, but just a, a follow-up on that. Uh, JCO can be used in, in several ways. One of the ways is to take JavaScript code and make a component out of it, and another way is to transpile it to a, an existing component to run on the web. And so it sounds like maybe the binaries you're thinking of is when you take JavaScript source code, yeah. And so that means embedding a full spider monkey interpreter and hence the big binary. Probably what you guys have with your smaller executables are maybe just some Rust code that ends up compiling down to something much smaller. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, yeah that's a little confusing. Jayco is used in two ways. We mostly show there the transpilation part. I think what you're referring to is like running JavaScript in Wasm. So, um, well, I don't know much about the browser, but I know at least for running Wasm in the browser, at least things that I've played with in the past, like Rust, 
you can compile to Wasm with U, right, and one that um, for client side. U.rs? Yeah, U.rs. So how does, I guess, the work that you've done now for interacting with the DOM, how does that play with that? And is this sort of like, oh, the evolution of that with components? How do you see that? I, I think this would be the next evolution of that. So you would, now you, I'm assuming, you're using, using Wasm bind gen, and this work is like some of the people that have actually worked on Wasm bind gen are now looking at this as a solution, as a better solution than Wasm bind gen. Wasm bind gen was a great experiment, works really well, but there are improvements to may, be made on top of that and make it cross language. Wasm bind gen is only for us. Yeah. So yeah, you would probably retool, if this actually works out, and hopefully it does, um, you would retool on top of this. Thanks. Hey, awesome talk. Um, so I, I'm curious, this is uh, abstracting over an HTTP request to reach the server, right? Um, and so I was curious, you know, there are other technologies for networking in the browser, like WebRTC, WebSockets, things like that. I, I was wondering if you'd done any work kind of getting um, the same semantics to work over those protocols? Uh, not yet, uh, but uh, anything that's in the web platform that we can use is, uh, is fair game and we'd love to implement that. Cool, cool, thanks. Make sure the next question is that side. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Ralph. Yeah. Uh, great talk, thank you. Um, when I think about uh, serverless, um, I thinking more, uh, maybe traditionally there's like Docker kind of serverless. And one thing I try to compare with um, this kind of serverless with that is um, the support for third party libraries that you, you would use in um, serverless endpoints. Uh, for example, I, I have a Python uh, endpoint that manipulates, for example, PDF. Um, the, how much does this make sure that um, the libraries that I use over there would be supported, also can be done by the service worker. Um, any comments on that? Uh, is, is the libraries you're referring to, are they uh, in like your, the programming language libraries or are you referring to uh, like other services that you're calling out to? Uh, th uh, language libraries, so uh, like for example pandas or numpy, those kind of things. Yeah, so actually Joel could speak to uh, this a little bit better than I. Um, Yeah, so I, I'm the maintainer of Componentize Pi, which is kind of the, the tool for uh, converting Python programs uh, to components. Uh, and uh, Pandas and, and NumPy and SciPy and others are interesting because they're not pure Python. They involve native extensions written in either C++ or a combination of C++ and Fortran. Uh, and that is challenging. Mm -hmm. Fortran in particular is challenging the path from Fort, Fortran source code to web, WebAssembly is not mature yet, and uh, that's been a, a, ch a challenge. Uh, there are ways to make it work. The PyDide folks have done heroic things to, to make it work, but uh, it's, it's hard to replicate, and it takes a lot of maintenance. Um, so yes, in theory, NumPy actually does work really well. It's one of the more better behaved native extensions, and you can, there's examples in the Componentized Py repo of using NumPy. Uh, Pandas, uh, I, I believe that, if I recall correctly, that's using CPython, and it turns out that used C++ exception handling, which is not part of the WASM spec yet. So it's a long story. <laughs> uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're making progress, uh, but you can't just take any arbitrary off-the-shelf Python wheel and expect it to work. Uh, someday, maybe we will be able to support that. So the, your example uh, component in the Componentized Pi for HTTP that does a SHA-256 of uh, URLs, uh, is running right here, completely in a service worker. So it's making an outbound request and doing a SHA of that URL uh, body. So if no one else has a question, I would yield? No? Okay. Um, so if I understand correctly, every single JavaScript API call that you make needs to go through the service worker, right? No. Uh, so uh, the service worker is um, 
just to intercept the outbound HTTP requests. And the actual execution is actually happening on a dedicated uh, worker, because you kind of need to treat the service worker like a main thread, because you don't want to lock up uh, outbound um, uh, HTTP requests. So it, even though a service so worker you, you can't. Have to trip yeah, so I have to do a bunch of post messages with transferable objects to make this work. Um, so because you can't spawn another worker from the service worker, and uh, you really can't communicate to another worker from the service worker in a good way. So you have to go through the window object and then uh, the window thread, and then pass that message to a dedicated worker and then back. So you mentioned JSPI, and that's what they actually want. And um, so this th is in Chrome that you can test already. Did you? So um, this is this is a uh, origin trial uh, token registered. So it's using JSPI right now. Uh, oh, okay, cool. This is, uh, but I also have this working for Asyncify. It's just I don't have uh, Wasm Opt being able to run in the browser itself uh, yet. Um, uh, otherwise, I could show that uh, as a transpile, you know, step of uh, instrumenting the Wasm binaries uh, as well. But it's an extra build step. Yeah, cool, thank you.